Hello, 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 and welcome to the Scouse Science Podcast. It's great to see you. My name is Professor Tom Solomon. I'm here at the University of Liverpool, where I'm Professor of Neurology and Director of the UK's Emerging Infections Research Unit. My guests today are BBC Northwest's Mairead Smith. Hello. Professor Graham Medley, who sits on the Government SAGE Committee, as well, of course, as Holly Ellis, who is our real Scouse scientist. Say hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, Hi. Good to see you. And um, first, a little bit of housekeeping, as always. Uh, We love to hear from you. So if you are on Zoom, we'd like you to post your comments into the Zoom chat function. Uh, If you're on Facebook, you're probably not hearing us now because unfortunately we've had some technical challenges which the team are trying to sort out. So we hope our Facebookers will join us soon. Uh, They may be joining us via the YouTube, but anyway, the guys are going to keep me posted. Uh, Anyway, the messages and comments will be coming in onto, uh, at least onto Zoom, and Holly will be keeping an eye on those. And as always, we like to hear from you. We like to start with a, a poll question. So please post into the chat. Tell us where you're listening from or watching from. Tell us whether it's your first time or you are a repeat offender. And then also today's poll question is COVID-19 on the TV and radio. Too much, too little or just right? So please post your answers. Are we getting too much COVID-19, too little COVID-19 or just the right amount? And I've got a message from the team who I think are saying... We are now live on YouTube and presumably they're putting a message onto Facebook telling the Facebookers to go and look on YouTube. It's all terribly complicated. Do you remember when we used to just chat over a cup of tea without any electrical involvement? Um, Anyway, let's see what people are posting in terms of answers to this question. Uh, Jenny Morris is there as usual, but Jenny, you've not answered the question. Is there too much COVID-19, too little or just right? And I can speak like that to Jenny Morris because she's my mother. (laughs) <laughs> uh, let's see what people feel about the COVID, COVID-19 on the TV and radio too much, says Roger Phillips. And Roger Phillips is a, <laughs> a BBC radio broadcaster. He thinks it's been too much. OK, <laughs> but he did a special programme on the one year of the pandemic. I don't know if you if you heard that, Mairead. Uh, yes, but, yes. Yeah. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I'm surprised to hear him say it's too much, though. I know, but maybe he, yeah, maybe he feels it. Let's see what others are saying. Mm-hmm. Just about right, says Janice Skilton. She's a regular. Philip Mails from the Wirral. Too much. It frightens the old people. Okay, good. We'll keep those. Please keep those answers coming in, and uh, Holly will keep an eye on them. Okay, I'll uh, come back later, Tom. Yeah, we'll catch you later. So this is our tenth Scouse Science podcast. Uh, we've had some great guests in the past. Jan Ravens uh, was, was the last guest. We have Frank Cottrell Boyce. Roger Phillips has been on, Jane Garvey, Andy Burnham. Uh, we've had lots of discussion about diagnostics, vaccines, treatments. And if you missed any of the previous ones, you can go to your podcast supplier and search for South, South Science Podcasts and then rate, review and subscribe. And if you don't know what any of that means, which is probably, I would say, about 80% of our demographic, then ask your children or grandchildren to help you uh, rate, review and subscribe to the podcasts or tell a friend. Anyway, that's enough of me. Let me introduce our guests properly. So first of all, Mairead Smith. Uh, She uh, grew up in Northern Ireland and came to Liverpool in 1997 to study politics and communications at the University of Liverpool and has been in the area ever since. She was elected General Secretary of the Guild in 2000 Uh, but always wanted to be a newsreader and began her career in radio journalism commercially initially and then the BBC and then moved across to Northwest Tonight. Am I getting all of this right? That all sounds just like me. Yes, indeed, it does. Yeah. Okay, great stuff. So um, let's start. I mean, you've covered lots of different things over your over your years of, of, of broadcasting. What would you say has been your biggest story? Without doubt, it is this last year. There's nothing that compares to it. And when I was commenting on what Roger said, Roger is a great friend of mine and we'll have this discussion together, some st- hopefully together at some stage. But uh, thinking of this, it has just been part of every level of our lives. And it, with other stories, there's some kind of, unless you're directly affected, there's an escape, there's a coming home, a closing the door and trying to leave some difficult stories behind you. Um, I grew up with 
the very end of, of the troubles in Northern Ireland. So that kind of thing didn't affect me the way it affected um, older journalists. But, you know, those things, unless it directly affected you, there was a way of being able to, to close your door. But this has been everywhere, part mm. of all of our lives. And the room that I'm in now is where I did a bit of, you know, working from home last year when I was political editor for a three month stint at the start of the pandemic. It was absolutely unbelievable. I couldn't have imagined it to be like this. So without a doubt, it's it's this last year, it's the pandemic. And yeah. because it just because it's been part of, of every aspect of my life, mm. of everybody's lives. Mm. It's the it's the kind of inability to leave work at work, isn't it? Which mm -hmm. I think. And Graham, I'm guessing for you as well. Let me introduce you first and then we'll and then we'll ask you about this. So so Graham's, uh, as I mentioned, uh, he is a member of the government SAGE committee, the scientific advisory group for emergencies. He's Professor of Infectious Disease Modelling at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He, as well as sitting on SAGE, he's the chair of SPY-M, uh, which sounds rather uh, James Bondish, of course. Um, I don't think you came up with the name, did you, Did you, Graham? No, but it is why I joined it. Yep. Yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> we all want to join something like that. And uh, we'll hear a bit more about that later on. Graham was born in London, um, moved to Portsmouth, where he went to the local grammar school and then the University of York. And uh, he became interested in computer science, partly because his dad thought computers might be a big thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, back in the 70s. He, did, was, he wasn't wrong. Yeah. Did he have, did he have other, other good predictions, your dad? Uh, not, not that I can remember immediately, no, but that was... That was that his was biggest. It. Yeah. And he, uh, you followed a, a woman to, uh, to London and mm -hmm. uh, married her and had children with her and she was uh, from Ainsdale so that's your your little that's right and she's still upstairs she's upstairs still so just is she? yeah oh yeah, yeah is she listening <laughs> no no she's she's on her own meeting Do, yeah. doesn't doesn't she listen to your every broadcast Graham surely <laughs> no. <laughs> no she doesn't <laughs> okay and you so we were we were saying that the pandemic's been one of those things that it's really you can't leave uh, work at work and I guess you've you've found that as well over the past year yeah absolutely it's been 24 7 for the past year um, and it's carrying on so uh, I've just been asked to stay on as chair of spy M for another year um, so I think you know it's and and not being able to leave it behind um, as you say uh, as Mairead says you know closing the front door and uh, it doesn't work anymore because you know I'm here in my living room and and, and this is where I'm working yeah. yeah, yeah. And you, uh, you've you been involved in other uh, disease outbreaks in the past, mm -hmm. uh, I think particularly of HIV and AIDS. Was, you know, at that time, I mean, clearly a massively important uh, disease, which still affects many people. But at that time, did it have the same kind of impact in terms of, you know, personal lives for, for people like you as a scientist? I don't think so, partly because partly we couldn't do this kind of working remotely and we weren't, you know, there wasn't any kind of lockdown as a, as a result of it but uh, it's quite interesting to see the parallels you know what happened then what happens now um and um yeah it's epidemics and public health and infectious diseases is what i've been working on for the past well for all my career yeah yeah and and um what i mean you mentioned differences from the hiv aids uh pandemic as it's turned out to be We'd, i don't remember anyone really calling it a pandemic at that time we tend to think of pandemics as acute infections rather than chronic uh, mm -hmm. diseases but i guess it it, 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 isn't. it was just slower um the kind of big difference was the fact that i i used to go once a month up to pa, PA or public health england it wasn't called that then but i used to go up and uh, they had all the cases details of the cases written down on the cards so i used to copy those out uh, by hand but now of course it's all all the data's collected uh, mm. electronically and everything's done electronically it was just it was different times but on the other hand it was very similar in terms of the fact that you know one day in the newspaper you would have a headline saying we're all going to die and then the next day would be a headline saying oh it's completely overblown um and so that that is still similar you know this kind of trying to understand what's going on both in terms of um, the people making the decisions the scientists the public you know kind of jumping from extremes trying to find out pick out the the kind of fact from the fiction uh, is something that's that's true of both pandemics and, and of course the media has a, a really big role to play in that doesn't it in in picking out the facts from the fiction deciding what's a story what isn't a story 
Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, it'd be very interesting to hear from Maraid what, what she thinks in terms of it. But I mean, from my point of view, it's been quite frustrating in some ways um, because the media does like a story. Well. well, we do. That, yeah, that is that is true. And, uh, you know, when I'm talking about this and um, being part of all of our lives and it's what's different about this is that it's not like some other topics that you might cover. You think, well, what's our next angle? You know, it's it's there for us. It's moving. Um the information is coming, all of the government briefings as well. You know, we were right across those. And we had selected opportunities to be able to question. They didn't happen every time. You know, it was very, very limited the number of times that we could ask from the Northwest. I think I could count on one hand the amount of questions that came from Northwest journalists to those briefings. And of course, they get mixed up with press, radio, um, and television. So we all had to take our turns. But that made it entirely different. You know, you're hearing this government message right at the start. We would respond to it. And it was one of my main jobs, I suppose, this time last year was that roundup, as we called it. And I felt quite uncomfortable sometimes because we were, we were talking about deaths, cases, and, and remembering that every one of those deaths was somebody's loved one. And that, that has been really difficult. And I'm sure everybody shares that. It's all behind of all, all of those numbers, there are people and getting the, then the time to tell the stories behind those people. I suppose at the start, deaths were much lower in numbers and we had the opportunity to maybe um, show pictures. But the, as, as those numbers built, I felt that it was really difficult for us to remember everybody. And it's something we've been really, really conscious of and careful to try and get across that that we do care. And it has impacted our newsroom as well. You know, I know of colleagues who've lost lost loved ones to um, the disease, impacted their families. Um, so it's ent entirely different. So, you know, yeah, we do want stories, but they, they haven't stopped. They've been there. And in terms of data and working out what what things mean, the impact of um, vaccinations on, on this opening of lockdown, I'd be really interested to hear, you know, that mm. kind of positive spin, because I still am very cautious and very conscious that maybe maybe we will go backwards but mm. you know it's it's hard to know yeah i think uh, i mean that point about maybe we'll go backwards so i i, I kind of spent the first year uh, being optimistic um and trying to say positive things were in all my media uh, work um but it sort of became clear that every time you thought things were improving you know we'd get hit in the face again with something uh, that's you know, in a way, predictable. I, I guess uh, virus, ch you know, viruses change, mutations happen. Um, so, in a way, it's it's predictable that there might be a mutation that uh, transmits more easily and causes more severe disease. But uh, I, 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 yeah, I mean, I'm now sort of rather, you know, again, the sun's shining. We're easing out of lockdown, but I'm kind of expecting the next slap in the face. Really, Gra Graham, are you going to deliver us a slap in the face today? Oh, well, I think it's a period of real uncertainty. So I wake up some mornings and think, actually, no, vaccines are going to work. You know, everything's fine. And then other times I wake up and it's a bit like, um, you know, watching a disaster movie where people come, you know, everyone's high fiving and the pubs are open and the weather's getting warmer. But you look at your watch and you think, oh, there's still half an hour of the movie to go. Um, mm -hmm. It's not over yet. Um, and I, and I, I suspect it isn't over yet. Whether what that means in terms of what the government has to do, uh, I don't know. But you know, I, I think there are many more twists in the tale to come. What, what's your worst fear about? What would be the worst twist at this stage? Well, as, as you said, it's the variants. I mean, the vaccines mm. will probably have some effect against against all the variants. Mm. But if if a variant comes along, which is able to to get round, you know, fifty percent of the people who've been vaccinated, then you know we've we've made things a bit better. But actually, it's two steps forward, one step back. Um, and how likely is that? How how will you know? And I, I don't think anyone can put a number on it. It's it's a it's a real possibility. It's not just a theoretical possibility. It's a real possibility. Um, but it it's either going to happen or it's not. Um, I think that, that you can put in measures, play in measures, some measures in place to reduce its chance. So get, keeping the prevalence low is a really good idea. Having some kind of border restrictions is a really good idea. Uh, but those just reduce the chances rather than making it impossible to happen. And um, of course, well, whilst you've got big outbreaks, massive outbreaks in places like Brazil, yeah, uh, you know, uncontrolled transmission of so much virus is, is just the sort of environment that leads to new variants. You know, yep. even in this country, if we 
if we get the levels very low in this country, then there are unlikely to be new variants that arise here. But um, I mean, that's why these, you know, that's why it's a global issue, isn't it? That's why it's so important mm. that vaccines roll out globally. Yeah, but it's all unlikely, low risk, high risk, but it's all a chance effects like rolling dice. Mm. You, know, you can't be absolutely sure. Well, let's be well, positive. Yeah. <laughs> well, sorry, Mary, go on. No, I'm just wondering, you know, when you talk about that global response and, and the vaccine rollout, you know, so obviously we're all really delighted to see that it's moving down the age groups in terms of people being able to get that vaccine here. But unless that happens across the world, are we not always going to be in this, this level of trouble? Until they or until, uh, you know, if you take somewhere like Brazil, if, it, if the virus burns its way through the community, you, you will get herd immunity. Uh, you know, people will be resistant. You remember this was talked about at the beginning mm. of this pandemic. So, so basically, you know, viruses work their way through communities uh, until everybody's either got sick or, or got better. And vaccines just speed that up in the sense that they give a lot of people immunity without them having to be sick. So, so it wouldn't go on forever, I, I wouldn't think. Um, but, it, but, but, you know, places like Brazil might breed new variants, which then go and spread to other places. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it'll be over when we get used to it. I mean, there's a biological thing of what happens you know, to the virus, but then there's also a social thing. You know, at some point, regardless of what the virus does, we will have to accommodate it in our lives and in our thinking and in our risks. Um, and, and that's when it's over. Um, and, and rather like flu in a sense. I mean, yeah. you know, we don't bat an eyelid, but if you think about it, flu every year, there's this terrible virus that kills lots of people mm. and would kill more. Uh, but we vaccinate and we, we change the vaccines uh, strains every year and, and we protect uh, the vulnerable so i guess graham in a sense we have to sort of sit this out until this covid settles down and and behaves like flu both as a virus and in terms of the public's response to it yeah i mean it's really up to marae to decide when they when the pandemic's <laughs> over because she just stopped she stops writing about it um, <laughs> we stop talking about it it's so hard to think of um and i was speaking to a colleague who joined a, you on eleanor moritz and listening to her it's it's that whenever you're looking at your bulletin and oh God, there's been so few that haven't had covid in them you know i think it's like a, an exception when you say oh this program doesn't have covid i think it's happened i haven't worked on one of them i'll be honest but i think a colleague steve had said oh there's no covid in it but it's it, it's just in everything that we do so i i really don't know when there'll be a, a time that we do not that there's not some reason to mention coronavirus in a news bulletin that is some way off. And when you said, Graham, getting used to it, getting used to COVID has been part of our lives. But and you talked comparing it to flu, but with flu, we we weren't wearing masks. Social distancing wasn't what we did. Maybe you, you kept away from older relatives occasionally if you were a bit ill, but it wasn't mm -hmm. something that you you definitely did. And mm -hmm. so the, the mask wearing, getting used to it, will that be something i know it's been said it will go on for a while but is that something we will just have to get used to mask wearing for a long long time um quite possibly but i mean it's the same you know with hiv with aids that it, it used to be the major topic of conversation it used to be the focus of the media um and but it isn't anymore um but it's still a problem um and so we, we just learn to live with these things and we learn to adapt to, to them and and when we've got through that. So that at some point in the next year, you will be doing broadcasts that don't mention coronavirus. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and as I say, that's, that's actually when the epidemic's over. But in, I mean, in fairness, the, the, uh, the, the, the media report, you know, there, as things change, because things are changing, oh, yeah. you know, we're coming out of lockdowns, things change, you know, there is a, a degree of uh, responsibility there but let's what I'm going to do let's Holly has been keeping an eye on the poll let's see what the what does the public what does our great public think uh, of whether Covid is being overdone or underdone in the media and um, so there's lots and lots of different responses I've just dotted down a few so some are saying it's about right some are saying it's about right but needs to be adapted to change in circumstances and new information and um, your auntie Judy Tom is yeah. saying that um, you don't have to listen if you don't want to which is true just turn the telly off turn the radio off um, Mark Tasker who's from the NHS is saying there's not enough coverage 
Um, Richard Morris says there's too much COVID and we need more jazz and weekly Scouse Science podcasts. So that's um, quite a good one. <laughs> Are you sure that wasn't my Aunt Judy with that one? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's also there's someone watching from Germany who's just commented on YouTube. So if you are watching on YouTube, then make sure you put your comments in as well. Um, and then I've just got a few questions if you want me to go ahead, go yeah. ahead with those. Yeah. Um, so there's one for Graham from John Topping, who says, can you tell us how you transitioned from computers to infectious diseases? Yeah, so I, I, my first love was always biology. And so that's the, the degree I ended up doing was half biology and half computer science. So, so it was my dad who was saying, you know, do something with computers. And I managed to find this degree. I don't think it, it runs anymore, yeah. um, which was half and half. Um, and so I could have ended up, you know, studying zebras and, and lions on the plains of the Serengeti, but actually ended up with working on infectious diseases. Yeah. Oh, great. Similar to that was my ideas of biology degree as well. So same for me. And um, there's a question for um, Marie from Louise Elman, who's asking, um, could the media do better in distinguishing between scaremongering and important new information? Thanks, Louise. Um, it's, it's hard to know what you mean there because when you're saying about scaremongering and important information so what we have done which is very different is we've started to do and this started quite early on is we answer questions you know we take we ask for viewers to send in their questions we will give information about the expert that we would have on so it would be an expert in infectious diseases tom i think you've done stuff with us and we've had um public health leaders from across the region so it's been very very important for us to make sure that viewers know that they can ask questions and sometimes we'll follow it on with the Facebook live as well after with more questions. So in terms of scaremongering, we make sure that what we report from the BBC is, is checked um, we have fact checkers as well. We have people that can break down information. So what we will always try to report the truth. That is what we will always try to do. I can say that with integrity, that's something that is really important. Um, but in terms of scaremongering, I suppose some people might say that giving too much bad information is scaremongering, but if it's true, is it scaremongering? And, you know, we need to know the levels of deaths. We need to know because we have a responsibility to make sure as a public service broadcaster that we give the information on, on how people can stay safe, the choices that they can make, and also updates and regulations that's something we find as well especially with our digital audience that people really respond to knowing what the rules and regulations are because you know i have lots of friends who've, who have turned off you know i would say people like me who've turned off from the media because they just don't want to know and then they literally do not know what the the rules and regulations are but they know if they go to the bbc that you will find the the correct information it's properly checked and I think delivered in a, in a proper way. So I suppose I can say that, I'm sorry if people feel that, that we give too much negative information, but it has been a year of, of really difficult stories mm. to tell. And we have tried to find that balance. Um, and what we will always do is tell the truth. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let's, we'll let Holly go and keep track on things. I, by the way, I found that, because I wanted to see, understand these things. I found the YouTube thing here. Um, it's not clear to me how you post on the YouTube thing. Maybe in the live chat, do you? Anyway, someone will someone will uh, explain it and 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 tell the YouTubers. Um, yeah, some interesting thoughts there. I mean, we we, we we've heard heard a perspective from from Graham in particular as a scientist and from Umaraid as a as a journalist. Um, I, Graham, you know, this has been a tough year for for people like y yourself, not just on account of all the the work and the research itself and, and taking that home and thinking about it. But then, you know, also on these interactions, I'm guessing your interactions with policymakers now are much greater than they were during the HIV AIDS, the, the, the starts of that. Um, yeah. you're, you're on SPY-M now. You have to remind us, it's the Scientific Pandemic Influenza Modeling Group, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. So, so this group was set up about 10 years ago. Um, uh, and the idea was, like all the science um, aspects, is is to to try and make sure that the decision makers get the best information. A bit like Marade saying for the public. Um, so, so I'm a kind of like a media 
put for the policymakers, if you like. The idea is to try and get all the information together and present them that with you know the, the uncertainty, the, the breadth of opinion, the consensus, you know, what it is that we all think in terms of the modeling, you know, what what what's going to happen. Um, I mean, we don't actually interact with the decision makers directly. I mean, there's kind of several layers of civil service between us and the, and the people actually making the decisions. Um, but that's been a real challenge. And that there's a kind of a real translation part of my job, which is to take what the scientists say and translate it into language that makes sense to the policymakers and then take the questions that the policymakers ask and, and try and turn those into science questions that you can actually answer um, and explain why we can't a lot of the time and how do you how do you feel it's it's all gone it's it's changed hugely i think there's a lot more engagement now than there was at the beginning um, i think that that there's a realization in some parts of the civil service that actually there is a lot of science that they can use and i think but i think initially they were just frustrated because we couldn't answer questions such as should we open garden centers? Well, you know, that's not a question that is actually answerable by science. Um, and I think that was quite, that was a source of frustration for them. Um, but I think I think it's much better now than it was. Um, mm. and, and, and yeah, it's been a challenging time, but I, you know, it's it's not as challenging as working in the NHS. I mean, I think you have to put everything into into perspective. Did yeah. you imagine that this was coming our way? Oh yeah, so we all knew that, that I mean that's why there is spy M and mm. we all knew that that there would be another pandemic. What you don't know is then how it will how people will react and, and how society will react, how decision makers will react to it. Um, but we all knew it just, just like we know that there will be a flu season every year. Um, but we know how we're going to react to that. Um, and so I guess and, though the Yeah, sorry, go on, Graham. I was gonna say that nobody i don't think predicted that or could have predicted that this is what would happen is that we would all end up you know working from home where we can and changing our the way in which we conduct our lives in such a big way I, uh, you know it's never happened before and and um, i mean is it fair to say so we knew something would happen the the the, the predictions were always around another influenza pandemic weren't they and mm. and a big one like 1918 we've obviously we've had pandemics in the intervening years but they never had such an impact um uh is it fair to say that the 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 uk preparations the uk plans were all based around uh, what we might expect for influenza and and therefore things like uh when we stop testing uh that's you know the influenza preparedness model says once you get to a certain point there's no point testing anymore it's here you've got to just deal with it and and is that do you think what influenced for example our decisions in this country to stop testing at one stage um you know, did did we have too much based around flu rather than thinking there might be other respiratory viruses that might behave in different ways? Yeah, quite possibly. Uh, I mean, we had to stop testing in the community because there just wasn't the testing capacity. Uh, but there wasn't the testing capacity because it wasn't part of the plan to be able to, to conduct millions of tests a day. Um, and so we, we just weren't prepared for that. So all those kind of <clears throat> People talk about the mistakes that might have been made in March, but actually those mistakes were made in the five years before that. Um, whether whether the focus was too much on, on influenza, I think, you know, in some ways, you, what do you focus on? Because you don't know what's going to happen. And now we could make the same mistake by just focusing on coronaviruses. Um, but actually it's going to be something else potentially, although there still will be another pandemic influenza at some point. So. It's, yeah and as i keep telling people it could be next year there's no reason why it shouldn't be next oh, year yeah. we've you know we've been waiting since 1918 it could be next year just like it could have been this year but yeah. i guess ah, don't well, say that <laughs> sorry <laughs> but, but at least we're much better prepared for it you know at least people are thinking about these things i i think we won't run public health and the nhs to the bone which is how it has been run so there's no capacity in either of them so that no, when you say about being prepared but i think what this experience as people are coming out of lockdown preparedness is all well and good but it's the appetite and the willingness to cooperate i'm not sure that will be there um and when you were talking there graham about testing what will there be an end to testing is there a a, a part of your modeling that says there is no point in 
mass testing anymore, the lateral flows that we're doing with young people, university students as a way to get them back. Will there be a point where you say there is no point in testing? No, I don't think so. I think that's up to people whether they want, whether they're able and want to get tested or not. And I, I think in the kind of future plans, um, the, the upscaling of testing is is baked in. So just like in you know Singapore when when this started uh, and um, uh, um, and um, other countries had huge testing capacity because they had learned from SARS, and now we've done the same thing. You know, we've now got this huge testing capacity. So whatever the next pandemic is, we will have a very big testing capacity. So we won't have to do what we did, which is to stop community testing. Um, I think I think Mairead's saying, will we, like we're currently testing, will this go on forever? Mm. And I don't, I don't think it will. If, if you think about what Graham was saying earlier, um, you know, we don't test everyone for flu all the time, but we do sentinel testing, which means testing a small number so that we can then see, oh, this is what this year's flu virus is. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it might well be that that continues. People who are hospitalized with severe respiratory infections, they'll be tested and then we'll know, oh, look, it's coronavirus. And, and we will try and uh, perhaps through those routes, see whether the coronavirus is testing. But we won't all, I don't think we'll all be testing twice a week uh, with home tests. Yeah, like, who, know, who knows? I think in some settings there might be, you know, I think there are some some businesses, for example, you know, where where no longer do you want people coming to work who are ill. Um, so actually, they may well be testing on a very regular basis. I mean, who knows? I mean, there's some and there's some settings, you know, like hospitals, yeah. like Health prisons, care homes, like care, care homes. homes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then it's always going to be a risk. So that you know, that testing might well be baked in. Yeah. The, I mean, Mairead, you were asking about masks earlier as well, and I think so. If you go to Asia before all of this, you know, I, I, I work over there, and um, uh, I remember in particular in Hong Kong uh, visiting. Uh, a friend um, uh, who we work with and noticing that somebody was just walking along the corridor in a mask and I thought gosh that's a bit strange and and I thought they must be paranoid but in fact uh, my friend explained no he's not paranoid at all he's got a cough and if you've got a cough you wear a mask to make sure you don't mm. pass it on to others and I think we may end up with that kind of uh, mentality rather than everybody having to wear masks to go into shops mm -hmm. um, but too, interesting what you say about willingness to cooperate uh you know you think if if we were hit with something similarly nasty let's say let's say we get over this and then something similar a year later do you, do you think people would be unwilling to cooperate do you think people have been unwilling to cooperate with with this um, um i'll be honest whenever i look at reports of pubs and beer gardens reopening people aren't socially distant um in shops they're not you know i, I went into a shop today went to one shop and just kept away from people. I didn't then venture out onto the street to see what it was like. But in terms of looking at the pictures of what happened yesterday, and I was off, so looking at you know my colleagues, the, the material that they'd gathered, and people having to be kept apart. You've got large groups of people that just do not socially distant. So if they're going to do that when they're going shopping and they're doing that in the pub, you know how how they live in their lives as well. So that idea of of keeping apart. And I spoke to my mum. She was. Um, outside a church at a funeral yesterday and she said I just felt so glad that I'd been vaccinated because there were it was a former colleague who'd been a teacher she was a teacher and pupils were coming up and chatting and she was just like she I, she said at one point I backed so far into the wall there was nowhere for me to go and as people are out and about there's that kind of fear of, of meeting people and but from what I see there's so many people that just do not stay apart at all and and no matter what you say they're just not going to distance and if that's now and that has been the case for months, um, well, what's going to happen if this happens again? Yeah, in interesting. I mean, I think I guess I'm I'm co contrasting the willingness to cooperate now with the willingness to cooperate at the beginning of the mm. pandemic. And I think when people are uh, frightened out of their wits when something new happens and it's not clear who it's going to kill, to be frank then people are pretty good at cooperating. And I, I think a lot of the changes in behaviours are as people have realised that they, as individuals, are not at such risk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I mean, we, we are, as individuals, adapting as well as as a society adapting. And that process of, you know, what... Because the, the, the government could do things like close pubs and then you can't go. 
you can open pubs, but but you can decide which pub you're going to go into. You know, are, are mm -hmm. you going to go into the pub that's actually packed full to the rafters, or are you going to go into the one where you know people are sitting two meters apart? I mean, now that's that's an individual choice as well as society choice. Mm -hmm. um, and there are always going to be people who are very nervous. But there are always going to be people who aren't nervous at all. Um, and so, you know, find finding ways in which we we live together is is really what what getting used to this pandemic is about you you talked mm -hmm. earlier on uh, graham about the uh you know the the, the 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 pandemic as long as it's being reported by people like maraid then uh that you know it still exists um do you do uh you know we we we, we talked previously about the agenda and who who sets the agenda for things like like what's in the media um what's your thoughts on that um, but I, I, so I think the media has a critical role to play, and I, and I think a lot of the media is, you know, kind of very mature and sensible and responsible, but a lot of the media isn't. Um, and you know, there are plenty of tabloid newspapers and others who who have just made this a very political football, um, and so that having a a view based on science that that you you might hold actually puts you into a political camp you know so 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 thinking that you know a lot of people are gonna are, might die is not you know just a, an observation or a you know a result of thinking about it or a result of working on it it's for somehow a political statement um and and that's i think been the frustrating thing and there was a period of time in the beginning of the, of the pandemic you know sort of march and april when politics kind of stopped but it soon restarted again. Um, what Bec stopped because? In what way did it stop? Well, it stopped being a. It wasn't a political issue. Yeah, but now it is, and there are plenty of broadcasters on one side or the other side, and plenty of people on one side or the other side. And you, and yeah, you that will comment on the response. Yeah, sorry, Tom. Do, do you feel you've been pushed into a? You know, you're you're a scientist. You look at data. You think about what it means, and then. The, your thoughts then get interpreted via things like SPIM and SAGE and, and become policy, which is then reported in papers. And you find that you're sort of being forced into a political camp based on your the scientific thinking. No, I don't feel forced into a camp, but what I say is interpreted as being in one camp or another. Mm -hmm. So so SAGE members are often being portrayed as being doom-mongers and lockdown merchants, and we're just trying to control the population, for example, which we're not. Is this uh, and, and uh, in the newspapers? Then you're described as that, or we're we talking about on Twitter. We're we talking about your trolls on on Twitter. Oh, well, all, everywhere. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's it's Twitter, um, but also you know the newspapers. Um, you know, and you how can, how's, how's that make you feel? Um, <laughs> um, slightly frustrated. I think that's where the frustration of the media comes from. You know, is that is that the media and the BBC? How I think have been excellent. You know, the media trying to convey the information uh, to allow people to assimilate all the risks and understand what it means for them is one thing but then you know uh, sort of you know various newspapers um uh but sort of pushing an agenda and saying no no this is this is not right this is you know a a communist manifesto or a fascist manifesto depending on which you read mm. it's just frustrating because it isn't yeah yeah. It was quite interesting, I thought, last week. I don't know if you'd heard um, the comments after Jonathan Van Tam had talked about the risks associated with AstraZeneca and how that was then reported the next day mm. that all of the papers um, had been very careful to really minimise that, that clotting risk and to report what some people had said was more responsible than they perhaps would have done with other issues. Mm -hmm. And that a lot of it was attributed to the fact that it was Jonathan Van Tam delivering that message and that his ability to do that. And, you know, he, he loves his metaphors, doesn't he? And to use language that was more understandable, presented in a way that really made it very, very clear just how low the risk was, really, really helped how, how likely it is that people will come for their, their second jabs and, and how, I mean, the story hasn't gone away, but it has been commented because it was him that that worry and that fear was reduced. Would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah, he's he's become a bit of a, a, a global media star um, for good reason, um, and and I think you're right. But that was an exception. You know, the vaccines were that risk of um, 
very low risk was presented in a way across the media that other things aren't. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I felt that was a really, um, you know, critical moment uh, because the way it was reported, be because it was done sensibly by all the media outlets, um, you know, we still have people's lives being saved today through the use of the vaccine. And there have been past examples in, in infectious diseases where vaccine programmes have collapsed because of uh, poorly reported uh, adverse events or even some adverse events that didn't exist at all, mm -hmm. if you think about exactly. things like music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That yeah. was interesting. Yeah. That's a good thing then, I'm glad. That was a really good thing. I mean, yeah, thank thank heavens for that. Um, let's get Holly back and find out what's been happening in the uh, Twitter sphere. Hi, um, yes, yeah, so someone was asking about the risks and how that was communicated. So that was good that um, you've already brought that up, Marie, because that's what a lot of people have been asking about. Um, three people have asked the same question now, so I feel like I'm going to have to raise it. It's just about the saying that after the first vaccine, um, say eight or ten weeks later, they've had a negative antibody test. Um, so can someone explain why that is? And now that they've had the second vaccine, you know, are they going to be negative for antibodies, you know, eight weeks later this time around? So I think it'd be good if someone could explain that. I'll have a go, or Graham, you can have a go if you want. No, Tom, you're, you're uh, up. Well, I, um, uh, so th there's a couple of things to remember. Uh, firstly, um, your immune response, your body's defences are more than just antibodies. Antibodies are like the foot soldiers, um, but they're very easy to measure. But you also have T cells, which are like the tanks in terms of the defences, and those are not easily measured. So when you're measuring antibodies, you're not measuring the whole immune defence. So that might be one reason why you're not able to measure it. And um, the other thing, I've just seen, looked at the questions as well. Um, the, uh, there's a range of test kits available and um, some of the commercial ones are not quite as, as, as strong as some of the others. So it depends a little bit on what um, test you're using. Uh, so, so basically, you, you are very likely to be protected if you've had the vaccine. Although remember, no vaccine is 100%. So you might just be that one in you know, 100 people who has not been protected by the vaccine. And that's why, one, you need to get your second dose. And two, that's why we all have all these measures in place that Mairead was talking about earlier. So we still want people to uh, distance in the pubs, to wear face masks, to wash their hands, because even when the whole vaccine programme is rolled out, not everyone will be protected because it, no vaccine works 100%. Have I answered it? Any, anyone want to add anything? Holly, uh, you're a scientist as well. Have I, have I covered it there? Yeah, yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, I'm not going to disagree with you, Tom. So, yeah, Ooh, that's sure. definitely right. We're here to disagree. That's what the program's all about. <laughs> yeah, no, um, there's, a, there's a couple of, have we got time for a couple of yeah, quick questions? On, yeah. Um, so Helen Shaw has put, um, was there ever any chance of the UK managing COVID in the same way as Australia or New Zealand? Or were there just too many differences in terms of social travel and population? That's a delicious question. I think for Graham, first of all, and, and then Murray can tell us about people's uh, compliance. But Graham, what, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, yes, but um, probably only up until the beginning of February. Um, so we could have we could have done the same thing, theoretically anyway. But I think if you think about what, what would have happened at the beginning of, Fe if, of February last year, if the government had said, right, we're closing pubs, I think you know, the amount of compliance would have been very, very small. And, and I think government is a bit challenged because it can't really go against the grain of what the popular opinion is and popular perception. Um, and once we got to the end of February, then, then we had a huge number of infections. I guess the other big decision point was June last year, when we coming out of that first lockdown, we could have stayed in it for a lot longer. Um, but the amount of travel that we have and the connectance of this country with others, I think, would have made it much more challenging than it would for New Zealand or Australia. Theoretically, yes, but practically, I don't think any government or indeed the, the, the population would have had the kind of appetite for what you would need to do to go for zero COVID, because you essentially have to stay locked down when you've only got, you know, 10 deaths a week. Yeah. And. Mairead, what do you think of uh, mm, you know, that compliance I, issue? Was a... 
Uh, really absolutely. Nice. I think I need to be a little bit careful. But what I do think is that there would not have been that that absolute desire to close borders and to stop travel. And I think if that had happened sooner, then we would have been in a different situation. But that would never have happened. We, It's just not the same. And I'm going to make it my business to find out what the opposition said in New Zealand and Australia, because we've heard what they've done and how it's worked. I haven't heard much from the people that opposed it and those groups, those voices didn't get out, did they? But I think we are in this noise of our own and I think it just wouldn't have happened in that way. It, it's still, it, it's crazy to think of some of the moves that were made in the summertime to try and encourage people to, to get out and, and trust society again. And there were reasons for those decisions, of course there were, but I think things would be done a lot differently now and, and perhaps it would be a lot harder. And obviously the, there's just that opposition, isn't there, to, to shutting down and telling people that your civil liberties are going to be hmm. very much compromised. I'm, I'm going to disagree with you both, especially oh. since Holly said she doesn't want to disagree. I like disagreement. <laughs> it's conversation. Uh, I think you're both completely wrong. <laughs> um, I think, like I said earlier, when people are terrified, which was February, March, that's the time when you can say, look, this is the way to handle this. This is what we do here. This is how we get out of this mess. And if we had done, of course, it's easy with hindsight, and I wasn't saying any of that at the time, but if we had done what Australia and New Zealand have done, um, of course, then we would be economically massively better off because we would have locked down until we got rid of the virus and then we could have eased things up. And that's what the Isle of Man has been able to do for, for, the, for the large part. As soon as they get cases, they completely close down until they've got rid of them. And then they say, right, we can carry on now. And I think, um, uh, and secondly, of course, the summer was a disaster, wasn't it? Eat out to help out, just help the virus out. And that again was our one opportunity to say, we're getting on top of this. We must now go for the zero virus game and uh, until we've got rid of the virus and then once we've got rid of it we can then ease up and we can we can test everyone that comes across the borders we can uh, make sure that we keep our country free from virus and we can have a thriving economy i'm saying that slightly stronger than i perhaps feel it but you know we need a controversial <laughs> yeah yeah but it's not it's it's one side but but then and I, I don't want to argue with you because i think that's a policy decision but then the contrast for that is is the imposition of, of rules that you have to put in place so i think there are something like fifty thousand australians who can't go back you know and, mm -hmm. and and in february when we would have had to have closed our borders we had loads of kids skiing in north of italy yeah you know what would we mm -hmm. have done with them we didn't have protesting capacity we, we, mm -hmm. we would have brought them back and stuck them in hotels on the wirral like we did uh, from, <laughs> from china yeah, yeah. Anyway, i could it, just it, imagine it, that disaster <laughs> it, it may not have been practicable by then but remember we are going to have future pandemics and yeah. so if in 2013 uh, 2023 what day is it we have uh, you know the next pandemic hits then a government that says Look, we know what the story is here. We know there are different responses. We think we should go for a hmm. Australia, New Zealand, Vietnam, Southeast Asia type response. And we're going to uh, lock down very tight until we've protected ourselves, stop transmission, and then we'll take it from there. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. do, you, do you think that, that what we've done perhaps wrongly here is that there's an expectation that, that people want to know dates. They want to know there's that need for certainty. And so it, even with this roadmap, you know, I. I will still feel a little bit uncertain about going into um, inside a pub, inside a venue, or this idea on the twenty first of June that it's all over. I, I just can't. I can't see it. Um, so that idea that we all want dates, and perhaps looking back to last year, th people thought, "Oh, I need to know when this is going to end." C can we reverse I think, that? I, I, I think you have to really distinguish between what the people want and what politicians say. And even what the media say, um, you know, I, th I think the big push to open everything up in in uh, in the summer was driven more by by uh, politicians than by people who were uh, affected by the virus. And I just, uh, you know, I think pe people clearly would put up with a hell of a lot. And I, I remember right at the start, we said, "Oh, you can only lock down for two weeks. That's as much as people will tolerate." And you know, we've just had people have tolerated four months of lockdown. Graham, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think the, the toleration has been something of a bit of an eye opener. 
Um, absolutely. I, but I think in terms of kind of the zero COVID idea of what, what else could we have done, it really needs global cooperation. Yeah, so the next, the next one, unless we got, you know, so if the whole of Europe have said, right, we're going to do it, then puts us in a very diff different position. Mm. But, uh, but uh, for this one, every country was making its own decision. Mm. Um, and I think that kind of global cooperation of, 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 of governments deciding what they're going to do and therefore influencing each other uh, brings about a very, potentially very different policy. Yeah. Now, people clearly want the Scouse Science podcast to continue because they're still sending in messages and questions, but we never go beyond 50 minutes because that's the ideal time for a podcast. So with lots more to think about and discuss, uh, we, will, we will stop there. Um, but I'd like to thank Mairead Smith, Graham Medley, Holly Ellis, and also uh, all the back room team uh, for this week's podcast, and also to thank all of our many listeners for sending in questions and comments. Uh, let me remind you that the Scouse Science podcast, all the podcasts are available. If you like seeing our faces, then you can watch them all on the University of Liverpool Facebook page. Or you can just go to where you normally get podcasts and you can listen to the podcasts. And when you get there, ask your young family member to help you uh, subscribe, rate and review. And that helps our figures uh, go up. But we're already at about 50,000, I think. Uh, the next uh, podcast, uh, I always forget to get hold of the dates and the details of the next one. The next one will be happening next month and there'll be some fantastic guests. So please join us then. Bye.